Hey everyone, welcome. We're just going to give it a minute or two to uh, filter everyone in and uh, give everyone the chance to come off their last meetings or their lunch hours or wherever they are joining us from. But thank you for being here. Um, we're really excited to, to have this conversation. Awesome. We will give everyone the chance to to filter in. Luckily, we are recording, so if they missed the beginning, they can catch up with us later. Thank you all for joining us today on a special Wednesday edition of our Space Talks. We're really excited to be here on a weekday. Um, today's event, Capturing the Stars, the Untold History of Women at Yerkes Observatory, is going to be amazing. Um, I'm not going to waste any more of your time. I'm going to kick it over to our space network experts and our space and Yerkes experts. Um, so Dave, if you wanna get us started, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dave Fisher. I'm the president of the University of Chicago Space Network. We are a, uh, an alumni organization. We're open to all alumni and current students. And, and we exist for, for, for the very simple reason of bringing people together who care about space. Uh, as I said, open to alumni and students. Uh, we host these monthly space talks. These are our signature series, and, and this is a, a, special, uh, a special episode of it. Uh, we, uh, we talk about astronomy. We talk about astrophysics. We're going to talk about history today. Uh, we talk about new space companies and about financing them and about creating them and making them go. Really, uh, the wide range of things about space. So if you are interested in joining us, we'll put some information into the chat during the uh, conversation today to, to provide links. What we'll do today is have uh, Chris and Rich talk to us about this topic. I'm going to go on video mute, and then I'm going to come back at the end with some questions. If any of you have questions, please use the Q&A function, put them in there, and I'll moderate that conversation at the end. With that, I'd love to turn it over to Rich and Chris. Awesome, thank you. So um, as Dave said, I'm Chris Palmieri. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the rank of instructor with the university's Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. And I'm gonna be starting, starting off before I kick things over to Rich. And what I just wanted to do was to give everyone a really, really brief overview of kind of how this exhibit came about because um, we're here to talk about capturing the stars the Untold History of Women at Yerkes Observatory, which is still installed at the Special Collections Research Center. So if anyone is still in Chicago, you can check that out until December 15th. Um, and I also wanted to do this by sharing some photos with you because one of the really special things about working on this project has been the kind of wealth of different kinds of materials that we have. Um, and these, these photographs are just really special. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly, which I should be able to do efficiently after so many, so many years of doing this. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, great. So just to give you a sense of, of what the project is, since 2019, an interdisciplinary team from the University of Chicago Library and the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics have been working to develop methods and procedures that utilize low barrier, financially accessible equipment for the digitization of glass plates, so as to make them and their data available for scientific and historical research, as well as for artistic and creative pursuits. So in pursuit of this end, the team started working with things such as the observatory log books, and also began to investigate other archival materials that were 
related to the plates, to their production, to their use. Um, and this led to the discovery of a photo, which you can see here, uh, which was taken during Einstein's visit to Williams Bay in 1921. And when the team looked at this photo, they, they realized that there were actually a large number of women, like more than they would have expected. And so this got the group thinking about who these women might have been, what kind of work they'd been doing, what their lives were like as women at Yerkes, and then what happened to them after they left. Fortunately, some wonderful human decided to write the names of everyone in this photo on a version. And this was really the start of the Women at Yerkes project, was looking into these women. But the more that we looked, and I should say we also, because Andrea Twist Brooks uh, is director of uh, area studies and interim director of special collections, and she was absolutely essential to, to finding all of these women. Um, yeah, we, well over 130 names emerged out of these, these archival files of women who had been somehow involved or in contact with the observatory. And the research, as it kept growing and as it kept evolving, we were really able to establish that women were doing science at Yerkes in this period before 1930. Um, they were not only calculators or secretaries, they conducted research, they earned advanced degrees, they collaborated with peers of both sexes, and they, they remained involved with astronomy even after leaving Yerkes, um, many for the rest of their lives. So the exhibit was designed in order to foreground the stories of these women, as well as to in introduce visitors to the kind of science that they would have been doing at Yerkes in this period. Um, but I'm, I'm really not here to talk at you today. And so what I just wanted to do by way of kind of brief conclusion to this introduction was just to show you some of the photos that we have um, in order to give you guys a better sense of what um, the materials in the exhibit look like and the kind of um, stuff that we get to play with when we're trying to figure out who these women were and what they did. So just very briefly, this is Harriet Parsons, and she was uh, a student who got her PhD at the University of Chicago. She was very much um, self-funded and she cobbled together research funding in such a way that allowed her to get the PhD. Um, and we have these lovely letters where she's talking about asking for reference letters, uh, writing to the university to get free tuition. And you can really see the amount of grit and determination that she as a woman had to exert in order to ensure that she could get this PhD. We also have Evelyn Wickham, who got her master's degree at the University of Chicago. And she's particularly interesting because she left Yerkes to go work in the engineering laboratory of AT&T. Uh, she also, we have evidence that she used the 40 inch telescope as an observer in 1919, which is important because at this period, women weren't even allowed into the dome at Harvard College Observatory where their telescopes were kept. Whereas here at Yerkes, we have Evelyn Wickham uh, working with the telescope herself. Uh, Vera Gushi is another one of the women that we um, feature in the exhibit. Uh, she also got her master's degree from the University of Chicago. And this dress that she is wearing on the left in this image one of the students in my class uh, recreated this dress. So if you go to the exhibit, you'll actually see a full replica of this outfit uh, there, which is incredibly exciting. And then finally, we have Alice Farnsworth, who is arguably the best known of these women because she went on to become a professor of astronomy um, at Mount Holyoke. And she kept coming back to Yerkes throughout her life, even after she got her PhD. So the, the group photo here has her when she was a visiting um, faculty member. Actually, excuse me, she wasn't visiting. She actually replaced Parkhurst after he passed away um, in 1925 so that she could finish his projects. Um, here we just have another charming photo featuring many of the women I just mentioned to you, but also many more, right? There are, there are so many, and it's actually been really challenging to decide whose stories we tell, um, because 
there is really just so much to say. And the last one I wanted to show you here, just to give you a sense of life at Yerkes, this is the ski club in 1910. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the name E.E. E. Barnard. Um, and he is here on the left, standing with his skis, leaning on a pole, um, kind of with the rest of the Yerkes community. So that is all I want to inflict upon you right now. Um, I'm happy to return to the, the photos at any point and to talk more about these women. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Rich. So thanks, Chris. Uh, so I'm Rich Crone. I'm a, a professor in this Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Um, and I got involved with this project, as, as Chris sort of indicated to, uh, at the beginning, about talking about the glass plates. And we were thinking of uh, how can we uh, take advantage of this uh, wonderful uh, and un, un, uh, a completely unique uh, um, a collection of images of the sky as it was 100 years ago. And I've been doing that with a group of undergraduate students uh, because um, uh, because it's it's more fun to do something with uh, with with, uh, with undergraduate students than to than, than not, uh, but in particular, uh, I was part of a uh, the development of a of a major program in in our department for for undergraduates, and one of the features of that program was to uh, was was to feature research projects. So when it when it became evident that the that digging into the plate archives at Yerkes uh, was something that we needed to understand. Uh, that was uh, that was a perfect match. So that's how it started uh, from my end. And I, I just wanted to say, uh, amplify a few things that that Chris was getting at about the multidisciplinary uh, nature of the of this work. So the um, uh, we've been working very closely with with the archivists, uh, Chris is is on the the history side. Uh, we have uh, digital humanities uh, that's part of the game, and there are other elements of the library, such as a preservation group uh, that that is also involved. So it's it's really quite quite an interesting mix, and it's been fun to introduce the students to these various uh, other aspects of of the university's uh, um, um, you know departments and and and, and expertise. Um, but but let me just give one or two examples of of where it is that, from my perspective as an astronomer, having a connection with the with the history side or the archive side has has been has been interesting. So on the history side, the 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 logbooks that Chris mentioned, which are the the records that you keep at the telescope at night while you're taking data, uh, are are. Uh, essentially, record that the number of the plate, the type of plate, uh, the the uh, where the where the telescope is pointed, that sort of stuff. And if you just look at the logbooks uh, on an individual basis, on an, on a plate by plate basis, where you just want to know more information about what the picture is that you're holding in your hand, um, that's that's one thing. But but it occurred to me. Uh, fairly early on, that that these logbooks are an, just an amazing record of of what was going on at the observatory on a daily basis or a nightly basis. So if you look at it not on a on a plate by plate basis, but but as a continuing narrative of who was doing what, and you you start to build up this picture in your head about about um, about the collective effort at the observatory. So in some sense, I would say. These logbooks are 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 perhaps the most important uh, legacy that we have uh, that's that's uh, pertinent to to this group to, to the to this team uh, effort. So that's that's one example uh, on the history side. On the on the archive side, uh, uh, let me. Uh, one of the things that we're working on now with the group is is to uh, take old spectrograms of uh, of a star called Epsilon uh, Origi. And try to uh, digitize them and extract uh, uh, scientific information from them in a in a way that mo a modern astronomer would appreciate, namely uh, wavelength on on one axis and the intensity on on the other axis. So to to get the wavelength, you have uh, certain calibration uh, lines that are put on the spectrogram, but uh, but to get the intensity is a little a little trickier. And what what is done is to have a series of of spots of light that are deliberately exposed on the plate that have 
the right uh, uh, that have known ratios of of the intensity of light in this spot and the intensity of light of 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 the other spots on the plate. So you can do this as long as you have the Rosetta Stone that tells you what uh, uh, what in fact is the ratio of intensities that were that were exposed on that plate. So if had it not been for our our uh, connection with people who know how to get into archives and and do something like that, if it had just been me uh, working on my own, I, I would not have had a clue uh, of how to uh, you know what to do next. Uh, it would have just been a complete mystery. But fortunately, we did have people on the team who knew what they were doing, and we did find the Rosetta Stone, and now we can go ahead with the science. So that's uh, that's that's one example that it that doesn't really directly relate to the women who worked at Yerkes, but it, it gives, you know, it's a co kind of a coherent uh, project that includes all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So let me, well, let me just stop there. Yeah. Actually, Rich, yeah, the good, good point to stop because a lot of the women that I mentioned, so Elvin Horn and Wickham, for example, was working on spectra and yeah. she was, one of the things that she did were to measure these plates and kind of conventional narratives about the history of women in astronomy and astrophysics would characterize this sort of labor as being very gendered, right? Women were the ones who were measuring the plates. They were not the ones who were taking them. But at Yerkes, we know that women also participated in the production of these plates. And moreover, we also know that men were very much involved in measuring these plates as well. So Otto Struva, when he first got to Yerkes, he actually was doing exactly the same sort of measurements as women like Evelyn Wickham. And there's a case in the exhibit all on spectra because of how important this was. <laughs> so, um, right. Would it be helpful, actually, Rich, uh, would you mind if I dropped the link into the chat for the the log books that we've already digitized in case anyone is curious? No, that'd be great. Yeah. Like? Let's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we've learned we've learned so much from this project. It's it, and uh, I think one of the one of the things we haven't really emphasized yet is the is there's far more in the university archives about about this period of history at this particular place than than I think anyone had actually realized. So the 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 archives have been mined for papers by uh, Hale, papers by Struva papers, you know, that that kind of stuff about that have to do with building observatories and and uh, the, the, you know, the visionary stuff, we could call it. But for the what we're doing, we're finding this immense amount of material. I think, Chris, you called it a gold mine uh, that that hasn't been touched before. Uh, so we are what one of the things we've discovered is that the experience of uh, women working at Yerkes in, in the early part of the 20th century was completely different from the histories of women working at other observatories at roughly the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's new. And that's that's why we call it the untold history, right? Yeah. And again, just to go back to um, to, to reemphasize Rich's point about the interdisciplinary collaborations, right? I am not an astronomer. And it would have been absolutely impossible for me to make sense of the kind of work that the women there were doing without conversations with Rich and with the undergraduate research assistants. And we've really been working together to kind of reconstruct these practices and to, to get into the minds of these people, uh, trying to understand what it was like to be there, which has just been really fabulous. Chris and Rich, do you, is, is this an appropriate time to step in with, with some, some questions? Awesome. Yes, yeah, perfect. Uh, I'd like, like to absolutely invite everybody online to use the, the Q&A feature here in Zoom if you have some questions you'd like to add as well. I don't see any questions yet, but I will do my best to, uh, to get those posed. Yeah, uh, the, the first question that comes to mind for me is, is that uh, uh, the... Um, um, the, the fact that the work that was going on at Yerkes wasn't as, as uh, gendered uh, as work that was going on at other observatories at the time raises the question of why. Was that something to do with uh, the, uh, the, the individuals involved? Was it, was it uh, a, a policy? Uh, what, did, did, you, uh, did you have a chance to dive into that at all and, and reach any conclusions? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's it's kind of a multi-pronged answer. So on one hand, 
just the location of of the observatory and of Williams Bay itself was really special because it was both remote, but it was also accessible. So you could get there by train. And this, and it was embedded in a community, right? Williams Bay, which made it easy for women to find accommodations and places to stay. So for example, one of the things we see um, in contradistinction to Mount Wilson, right? Which was very much built like a monastery, there were no places for families to stay, very famously didn't have women's bathrooms. And it was really far away from uh, Pasadena, so, or excuse me, from the valley. So you couldn't like go regularly, you couldn't commute, right? And so um, women just couldn't be there in ways that at Yerkes, they very physic, they, they could, they could walk from their accommodation to the observatory and they could just be present uh, in a very, very unique way. Um, Rich, yeah. do you want to take the next? Yeah, I, I would add to that uh, just the academic side. So the University of Chicago uh, was <clears throat> was uh, co-educational from the beginning, and so when you when you admit graduate students to your uh, program, for, and, and in this case, the uh, astronomy academic program was at Yerkes. Um, there's only one kind of graduate student, and that's a graduate student. You don't you don't have male and female graduate students. They're they're all doing the same thing, and so that accounts, I think, for part of your question, uh, Dave, about uh, about the the academic side, and then as far as the staff side, um, that's 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 an interesting question. And and some places had uh, female uh, computers, and some had male computers, and some had both. And I think Yerkes was in the category of both. Yeah. Whereas yeah. someplace like um, Harvard and Mount Wilson tended to have kind of groups of women doing this labor in a very physically separated space. Um, mm -hmm. We don't see any evidence of that at Yerkes. Um, and the, the other really major one, um, again, Rich is the, the co-educational aspect of UChicago from its foundation really cannot be overstressed. Like that is so essential. Um, to just allowing women to be there and to be present on the same footing. But the other really important thing is uh, the director, Frost, we found, this was actually one of the most tremendous moments I think in my life as a historian, was I was going through the archives um, because we had taken a photo that wasn't quite clear, right? So we, we photograph the archival material and then we work with it. And so I had to go back to find this letter. And so I'm looking and I'm looking and I read it. And um, Frost talks about how they are running the observatory by woman power because all the men are old and he puts old in, in parentheses, married men. And then he talks about how the women are doing all this different kind of work and how they're having, how it's going great. And at the end of the letter, he says, um, and of course, the work of the observatory goes on as usual, which should come as no surprise to all suffragists, dot, dot, like myself. <laughs> and it's just like, this is, that was the smoking gun we were looking for. We we really couldn't, because yeah, we it was special and we were trying to understand why. And then we realized, oh, the director is is actively, kind of advocating for these women based on his own political beliefs. And it just really demonstrates, to me at least, the way individuals in positions of power can create climates that are better for people from historically excluded communities. So that's a very long-winded answer, but it's it's a fun one. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome to hear. Uh, uh, Chris Don Osterbrock wrote uh, a history of Yerkes Observatory, I think from the beginning to 1949 and, and, and uh, spends a lot of time in that book on, on Frost. And frankly, I don't think Frost comes off all that well uh, in that book. And, and this is, this is a really eye-opening to, to another really important side of, of Frost and his advocacy. There's a question that came in from Jerry that I, I think you've, you've actually begun to answer. Uh, 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 in your in your comments about uh, Frost, but uh, maybe uh, expand a little. It says, could you speak on the role of any significant men? I say maybe other significant men who had the power and the will to help women at Yerkes. Yeah. So this is yeah. Frost was 
very important, but actually I don't, and Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't actually know of a huge number of women who worked directly with Frost because in his capacity as director, he was a little bit more removed. So actually when we're looking at, at people, right, we see, for example, Parkhurst, right? John Parkhurst is working very closely with women like um, Parsons. He, he supervised her PhD thesis also with um, Farnsworth. Um, E.E. E. Barnard is another one. Um, he's actually quite interesting because his niece, Mary Calvert, moved to Yerkes in 1905 to become his assistant. And you can, if you look at his publications over the course of the next kind of 10 to 15 years, he will start by acknowledging her. And then the ways in which he starts acknowledging her role in his research become kind of more and more specific. Um, to the point that after he dies, it's Mary Calvert who finishes the the Barnard Atlas. Um, so yeah, there were a number of men. I think um, Lee also worked a lot with um, Hannah Bard Steele Pettit. Um, yeah, so there were there were actually quite a number um, there. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> The next question comes from um, Steph, uh, and this might be more along, uh, more for you, Rich. Uh, uh, can you say a little bit about what the, the women at Yerkes were researching? I know we've mentioned uh, taking Yeah, <clears throat> you're, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think I got the gist of the question, Dave. Um, so the research was, um, was, uh, uh, ground-based optical research, of course. That that's what that's what there was at this time, which meant uh, taking uh, photographs of things like star clusters, and uh, uh, and taking a spectra of uh, stars, and and the kinds of work that were done would be things like radial velocity measurements or Doppler shift measurements of stars, uh, which was an ongoing program. There was a kind of a, a somewhat organized, but uh, mostly uh, observatory by observatory effort to concentrate on particular fields of the sky called the cap time selected areas. And in those areas, you would take photographs with different filters and measure the brightnesses of the stars in them. You could measure the proper motions. Uh, all of this was pretty routine. Nothing terribly uh, exotic uh, was going on at Yerkes uh, in, in that sense. It was, it was common work uh, that other observatories were doing. But observe, but uh, Yerkes happened to specialize in high precision, in a few things, including high precision uh, measurements of parallax or, or distances to stars. And that um, uh, some of the women were, 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 were involved with that program as well. But a lot of spectroscopy, we, uh, to get back to that. So there, there's, that was quite a, a major effort. Thank you. I'm going to go from you to have some bandwidth on them, but I'll okay. try to get more questions. Hopefully they come. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a, a question up from an anonymous attendee. Chris speak how they built the exhibition. What did you like to include or research more to tell the story? <laughs> oh my God, this was so painful. I wish we had three times as much floor space. This was you know, we so we started with this idea that we wanted to excavate the women's voices from the archive. So we we wanted to use this correspondence. So again, one of the big sources of the archival material that we have are these things called the director's files. And this is basically all the correspondence between anyone and Frost during his time as director of the observatory, which unofficially started in 1902-1903 when Hale kind of decamps to California and then officially started in 1905 and ran in until 1932. And so um, we just had all these wonderful letters of between women and Frost um, and we really wanted to make sure that we were using materials that demonstrated women's agency and kind of their activities at the observatory. Um, the problem was is we just had too many <laughs> So our our exhibit designer um, at the at the library um, had these 
um, kind of paper cutouts of what the different cases were actually like full scale. And we would put things on them, right? Like mock uh, images. And we had to cut just huge amounts. Um, so it was, it was actually, it, it was more of whittling down than of building out because this is, it's just such a phenomenal uh, collection. And then kind of once we knew what letters and what stories we wanted to highlight, we were able to find other items to help illustrate these stories. So for example, one of one of the, the coolest things in the exhibit is we actually have a millionaire calculating machine that we borrowed. Um, and that was something that women would have done used uh, to do calculations. We also have the lens and the eyepiece from the Kenwood refractor, um, the eyepiece we borrowed from Yerkes and the lens we had at Chicago. And um, to kind of show you what one of these uh, instruments would have looked like, we also have a picture of Mary Calvert at this, uh, at this telescope. So it was, um, we started with the individual women and then we we tried to kind of build out uh, from there. I could continue saying a lot more, but I will. Oh, no, thanks, Chris. So uh, that's actually a good segue into a question for each of you uh, that, that came from uh, Nikita, which is what do you, what would each of you think is the most interesting item in the exhibit? And, and, and why do you think astronomers and astrophysicists especially should see the exhibit? Well, let me start with, uh, with the second question. So, uh, so I just gave a lunch talk yesterday to our department about the exhibit, and the whole point was to encourage my department to go see it. And my, I think what I was trying to get across was that, 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 um, you know, no, no, nothing stands uh, isolated. So we, we the science of, uh, 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 in general, but astrophysics in particular, is this kind of uh, progress because of individual people doing individual things, right? And those, what we what we tend to think of history as uh, the the greats, right? The the exceptional people and. Uh, but but one of the things we haven't really talked about this at, uh, yet uh, here today, but one of the things that's really come forward is that there's so many other people whose names you have not heard of that are that are really important and and they they are they are they're absolutely essentially part of the story. Uh, their work uh, is is uh, fundamentally important and they they their stories deserve to be told. So that's that's sort of a a message that that I hope our exhibit gets across, and I and I hope I got across to to uh, my astronomer colleagues that uh, appreciating that you know it's not just a linear uh, you know just a bunch of uh, a famous people who have contributed to astrophysics, and each one builds uh, upon the shoulders of of the one that came before, but it's a much more complex, much more nuanced uh, story with a lot more people. And then uh, Nikita, I think she asked about the uh, uh, what is our favorite object in in the exhibit. Um, so we mentioned a couple of them, but one one of them is the 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 relay that was used to uh, light the or and open the gates or to, uh, start the World's Fair in uh, this Century of Progress in 1933. So this the idea was that uh, the Yerkes Telescope would capture the light from Arcturus. And that uh, 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 electronic signal would be sent down to Chicago to open the World's Fair. And we have uh, a, a gadget that was built at Yerkes. Uh, it's actually on loan from Adler Planetarium, but that's there in the exhibit. And uh, one of the Yerkes women, Helen Pillins, is in a photograph. Uh, it's a wonderfully charming staged uh, photograph that shows her twiddling knobs on this machine. <clears throat> it's just very cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm and glad you mentioned the Arcturus. 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 <laughs> yeah, and what, wasn't Arcturus 40 light years away? So the light yeah. from it came from the, the Columbian Exposition in 1893. Yeah, okay. Exactly. That's, that's, why, yeah, that's exactly why they chose it. Because the light that was leaving Arcturus when the first uh, World's Fair in Chicago happened was now reaching us. 
So it was, awesome. uh, yeah. No, yeah, I love the Arcturus box. <laughs> Nice. Chris, what about you? Is is that your favorite too? Or do you have a, a another favorite? A I just second honestly, favorite? I, I love I, I just this this exhibit. I'm just I'm everything in it just tells stories. And I, I have a really hard time. I've already mentioned a number of my favorites. Um I would say uh I, I talked about um Evelyn Warnham Wickham a little bit earlier and how she left to go work in the engineering lab for AT&T. And I think one of my other favorite letters or objects in the exhibit is Frost's recommendation letter for her to go. And he basically, he says, you know, she's been working here for a number of years. She got her master's degree. She's been doing X, Y, Z. Um, you know, she's worked with the telescope and many instruments. So she will be well qualified to work in your engineering lab. And then he, at the end, he says that we will be sorry to lose her, but we recognize um, and I'm par I'm paraphrasing here, but basically we recognize that it's in her best interests to get other experiences and more money <laughs> than we can mm -hmm. offer her here. <laughs> and That's awesome. The, um, uh, the conversation has, has uh, largely been about uh, early 20th century women. Uh, can you talk about uh, two possibly related things? Uh, what about uh, women at Yerkes uh, uh, later in the 20th century? And then generally, uh, where, where, what did these women go on to do in their careers? Was there a, a common trajectory? Uh, are they all unique stories? Uh, but, uh, you know, upon leaving Yerkes, uh, uh, did they continue with research, for instance? Yeah. So the first question is the easiest for me to answer, which is that we don't quite know yet. Um, this is the next the next stage of the project um, is going to be looking at women at Yerkes after 1930. So this is really the area that we're moving into. We do know that there were there were fewer during the 1930s. And this is in part because of things like the Great Depression and also just the changing of power. Right. Otto Struva was director of of Yerkes during most of the 1930s. And we had an undergraduate research assistant this summer whose research strongly suggests that Struva prioritized helping Emma Gray scientists as opposed to women more specifically. So, um, you know, there, there'll be more questions, especially to see what happens later. Um, the economics of the Great Depression also cannot be uh, underemphasized. Um, and yeah, so, so stay tuned. <laughs> We'll, we'll have a better answer to that later. Um, and then as to kind of what happens to them. So a lot of these women do wind up going into teaching, um, some at universities. So um, uh, Farnsworth was professor at Mount Holyoke. Um, Gushy wound up teaching at Smith College for a while. Parsons also had a professorship. Um, and but but Parsons left her professorship when she got married. And so this is still very common. Um, in this period that when a woman got married, she left her career. Wickham is a little different. Wickham did stay at at and after getting married, but then as soon as she had her first child, she left. So there's still this kind of convention that you're not going to stay employed. Um, that I would imagine is something that as we move forward in the century, we'll see changing and kind of anecdotal stories about that kind of ring true. Um, some of the other women, uh, uh, Emily Dobbin is another person who is featured in the exhibit. Uh, she was uh, actually the first woman to get a master's degree in astronomy from the University of Chicago. And she actually went on to become a very active um, suffragette. So, um, and I believe we have found her working as a real estate agent later in California. <laughs> so there's... There are there are kind of yeah lots of different paths that these women um, took, but just the general the most conventional one was winding up in teaching. Dor Dorothy so Block, that, another example. Oh yes, please yeah. Yeah, yeah so Dorothy Block uh, was a uh, was a graduate student. She uh, she actually uh, came from Columbia. I think she got a master's degree at Columbia. Then she got another master's degree at Chicago. 
And then uh, she got married to one of the astronomers on the staff. So she got married while she was at, actually at Yerkes. We have a lovely photograph of her uh, wedding party at, at, at in front of the observatory. And then she went, uh, her, her husband was uh, John uh, Parascolophilus, I think, uh, hard, uh, and he uh, he was from Greece, and so he went back to Greece as uh, the head of the of the uh, Greek National Observatory, with the expectation that they would build a big telescope. But and that actually never happened. But there were connections with with uh, with uh, uh, Shapley at at the Harvard College Observatory, and the two of them managed to get uh, land the the responsibility of of running the Harvard Southern Station at Arequipa in Peru, and and so we've we followed this, and and so John gets the credit for being the director, but Dorothy turns out to be probably the the director, uh, you know, de facto. Um, so she, she is an example of somebody who went on to kept, keep doing astronomy and doing it in a way that doesn't show up easily in terms of her publication record. And that's one, that's another lesson we've learned, that the publication record is, is a very poor metric for uh, your contributions to the, to, the, to the discipline. Yeah. And, and Rich, thank you. To, to piggyback off of that, we have another woman, um, Hannah Bard Steele, who marries Edwin Pettit. And again, she, quote unquote, leaves astronomy after getting married. She does work as a as a computer at Mount Wilson, where uh, Pettit winds up getting hired her husband. But she she completely disappears from the record. Um, and it's it's just it's obvious to me, at least. And I think Rich would agree that, like, these women are not stopping astronomy. Like, they are still st remaining incredibly involved, even after getting married. Um and so this is, again, one of the things that we need to kind of do a little bit more digging to, to fully excavate their kind of post-marriage contributions. Can, can each of you talk a little more to that digging? I mean, these are some really fascinating uh, stories. You're finding somebody who disappears from the astronomy record and shows up as a realtor in California. Uh, uh, that story or others, can you, can you kind of walk us through a little bit of what what this 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 sleuthing actually looks like? Uh, how are you how are you doing this? How are you finding these women if 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 their um, if their publication record isn't there, which I would imagine is the sort of the fundamental way to to track an astronomer, at least a male astronomer. Yeah. So again, this is uh, so Andrea is the one who did the work in the the U Chicago archive, which is literally you call the box, you open the box and you start going through the letters. Mm. And the U Chicago archives, um, the director's files are organized alphabetically and chronologically. So basically you'll have a box and it'll say something like 1912 to 1914, A through B. And you just, you, you have to go through it and you have to look at all of these files and you're looking at the names, but also you're looking at, you're, you're kind of reading all just a huge amount of, of letters. Um, to try to find these women's names. And then once we have this information, right, we photograph all of the, the documents that are to women, from women, about women. Um, and we created these Excel sheets. So Rich mentioned, we are now working with um, Ochre at the university, which I'm sure he can talk a little bit more about. Um, but originally we just had a spreadsheet <laughs> and as you're going through the spreadsheet, you start seeing, okay, there's actually a lot of letters about this woman or to this woman or from this woman. And so that's kind of how we start um, figuring out who, who we can talk about, right? Who do we have the material to shed light on their, their story? Um, we also have used things like ancestry.com to find birth records, death records, marriage records. Um, and Newspapers, um, there are, I, I love how, so for example, a lot of the information about Dorothy Block, we found out because her family would put notices in the local Brooklyn papers um, about her winning an award or going to, to Harvard or going to Yerkes. So or being the secretary of the astronomy club at Columbia, right? So there's a lot of information um, that you can glean that way. Mm -hmm. and, and the Vassar uh, Alumni Association, 
So, so this is it's sort of fun. I'm sure, I'm, no doubt, the University of Chicago does something similar. But you, you, the alumni association collects little news items, and they will publish them about so and so is doing something or other. And so those have been quite informative too. Yes. That's really cool, Rich. Um, a, a question for you. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give away a little about both of our ages. Um, uh, I met you in 1985 at Yerkes Observatory. Um, I'm, I'm, I remember, uh, you know, uh, part of the zeitgeist at, at Yerkes. You know, these stories about the the great figures from the past. Were, were there any, any, uh, any discoveries you turned up in this research? That, that upended any of those sort of uh, common stories that were told around Yerkes about the, the big figures who, who had an impact on it. Right, so those, those stories uh, would have been <clears throat> the relatively recent stories, uh, meaning uh, from the, if we're, if we're talking about 1985, it would have been from uh, 1965 onwards would, would be the kind of period of time that you would, that somebody like you or I would have been hearing uh, things repeated. Um, so offhand, I can't think of anything that relates directly uh, to this, um, but I think that the, the main thing would be what, what we've already discussed, which was that the, that the Frost years as director um, have, have been kind of, um, uh, uh, the the narrative has been that was a bad time for the observatory because of Osterbrock's book. Uh, as you said, uh, Dave, uh, Osterbrock doesn't particularly, it uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of good things to say about Frost. Uh, and so I think one of the things we've done is to, is to tr we're trying to uh, put a, put a, uh, a counterweight on that, go, go in the opposite direction that he may not have been the visionary that, that George Ellery Hale was. He may not have been the visionary that uh, Otto Struva was. Uh, he, he didn't build observatories, but he but the observatory he was running had this incredible culture that, that Mount Wilson didn't have and Harvard did not have, um, and uh, McDonald Observatory did not have. So uh, so I think there's the, the, the sort of, if you think of a, an observatory as, as uh, as as incubating new astronomers, he was doing a fantastic job. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I do remember in Osterbrock's book too. He does a, a, a kind of grudgingly at the end admit that well, the people in Williams Bay really seem to love Frost. There's a park named after him and a road named after him, and and uh, and the like. So yeah, that's that's a uh, that's refreshing uh, yeah. to to hear that. Um, it's worth uh, it's worth uh, adding, Dave. Just just a second here. That that Frost also did things like um, reach out to um, uh, 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 astronomers in Europe who were uh, who were oppressed for whatever reason. For example, Russian astronomers during the the Russian Revolution who who were uh, in in hard hard times and other refugees and things like that. This, this is a part of his his character that um, is is not well known. What sort of lessons can we draw today from from the lives of these women at Yerkes? They they uh, they uh, were clearly in uh, uh, a supportive environment at, at Yerkes, but still uh, culturally, uh, of course, uh, you know the reference that, that Frost made to to uh, to suffragists. Uh, not not all these women had the the right to vote when they were beginning their their times at, at Yerkes Observatory. They went through a lot. They 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 persevered. What sort of lessons are there for us today? That's a fabulous question. Um, and I think the first thing that I would say is just like the importance of grit. Um, I mentioned this a little bit with Parsons, um, but we also have another woman that we talk about in the exhibit, Jessie Short, um, who I actually, um, uh, there's a, a piece out in the November issue of Physics Today about the Yerkes women that Short is featured in a little bit more prominently. and. So Short really wanted to do a PhD. Um, she wrote to the observatory originally in 1910 to inquire about doing a PhD and was told, we've never done this before. We don't know what the red tape is. Um, 
you know, sorry, like, you know, we don't, we don't really have a, a program for this. And again, to Rich's point, not for women, just for graduate students in general. Um, but then over the next couple of years, they figured out how to do it. So when Jesse Short writes back again, um, they're able to bring her on as a graduate student. And she was a direct contemporary of Edwin Hubble at the observatory and they're working together. And, um, but she wound up failing her exams. <laughs> and so she never got a PhD, but she ultimately wound up becoming a professor of mathematics at Reed College in Portland. And, you know, the, the things that you see in her letters between her and Frost and Parkhurst is just her, her absolute determination. Um, and I think that that's, that's really kind of inspiring to me that no matter what happened, she just kept writing back. She was like, I, I'm, I want to do this. Um, and the other would just be, again, as I already said, like the importance of individuals to create the cultures of institutions. Um, I, I do think it's really important that you know, Frost was the director and that all of this was able to happen under his watch. Um, but that was too <laughs> rich. Thanks. I, I think my bandwidth is getting better. I'm gonna risk this again and try to try to go back on, on video. Um, so uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the research group, as I understand it, included a lot of uh, current undergraduate uh, students at, at the university. Um, uh, normally I'd say, yeah, how did this experience change you? But I'm, I'm actually a little more interested. Did, did you see any changes in, in the students who were working on this uh, uh, program over the, over the course of their work on it? Um, well, um, I, the, um, w w w one of the things would be sort of what you would expect, right? So we've taken students who are first year students, right? They, so they're, they look, they're, they come to our department, they're interested in astronomy, they go to our, uh, our broker, uh, uh, Julia Brazos, uh, who, uh, who knows what faculty are doing what. And Julia says, well, you might want to talk to Rich. You know, this sounds like your interests might match. So I, I can actually get a first year student in the group. And, and by definition, uh, first year students are just starting off. They, they probably don't know much about astronomy. They don't know, have much experience with research. And then uh, they stick around. They, they, they can work in the group for, for a, a year, a two, three years. Um, and so by the time that they're, they're, they're graduating, um, I, I have seen them grow as a as a researcher, and that's just terribly satisfying. And and it's so I'm not answering your question specifically, but in a general sense, it's just very very. Uh, you know, they 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 learn tools in this process of uh, <clears throat> working with the glass plates that are not just you know how do I digitize a plate and how do I measure stuff on it. They do that too, and that's a. Uh, that teaches a lot of, uh, of basic astronomy skills because once you've digitized a plate, it looks like any other digital image pretty much. Um, but they also are getting exposure to uh, to figuring out how the old instruments work. Uh, we've, gone up, we've gone up to the observatory and, 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 and played around in the dark room. Uh, so they've been exposed to the, to the uh, original photographic processes. We've uh, gotten them into the archives. So, it's not just that it was, uh, the history undergraduates who have been working with Chris in the archives, but it's all the astrophysics undergraduates who've been working in the archives. And so they've they've been exposed to this kind of, you know, here's a box, let's take a folder out and look through the letters in, in, in probably a way that uh, very few other astronomy and astrophysics majors are, 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 are doing. And it's just a fun thought that, that you know, we, we, we give them this range of experiences. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. Chris? Yeah, and I would say even, you know, I was a history major as an undergraduate, and I did not do archival research as, as an undergraduate. Um, I worked with primary sources, but the, the actual, the, the ability to have such a rich archive just at your fingertips um, that you can walk into um, is amazing. Um, so I would say I, um, I taught a class last winter um, on this exhibit, right? And the students who participated in the class were invited to contribute to the exhibit and to help curate it, which was, I know you didn't ask about changing us, but I mean, that was a phenomenal experience for me as, as, a, as an instructor. But I would also hope it was 
uh, transformative for the students in the sense that because it was kind of half museum studies, half history of astronomy, half history of women, and yes, those don't add up, but there was one part of the class that was very uncomfortable for every student, like whether it was the astronomy part or the history part, like everyone was kind of like, I like this, but could have done without that. And I think that that's, that I hope was really special because it brought everyone outside of their comfort zone in some capacity. Um, so I'd hope the historians learned a little bit more about science, science learned a little bit more about history and, and that they all learned a little bit more about kind of thinking about gender and science and the impact of gender in science. Um, or at least I would hope, right? I can't. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that, that really is awesome. I, 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 might, I might suggest that, uh, that you, you, should, you should speak about school students as well. Especially here in the corporate world, uh, it is, uh, it, it, it's first for a lot gender-based discrimination, it's better today. Yeah, I mean, we all say that, but it still has a long way to go. And I think uh, lessons like like the one from Frost would be awesome for everyone. Uh, I see we're coming near the end, so I'd like to turn it over to, to you guys to, to just wrap up with, with final, final thoughts. Uh, Chris, how about uh, you go first? Um, well, just, yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming to this. This has been really phenomenal. Um, and if you can go see the exhibit, uh, if you can't go read the physics today piece, uh, and yeah, just, uh, if you have any kind of thoughts or questions, feel free to, to message me. I'm always happy to, to talk more about this. Um, yeah, thank you. Chris, thank you. Yeah. Rich, how about you? Yeah. So I, I I'd say the same, I very much appreciate the <clears throat> opportunity to talk to this group. Uh, happy to talk more offline. Um, and, um, um, uh, it just, it, you know, one of the, I hope this has come through very clearly, but, but this whole project has been just enormously fun, right? It's been very, uh, rewarding. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount and, um, we're trying to make sure other people can learn a tremendous amount as well, uh, through this exhibit and other things that we're doing. And Chris has not said this, but, but she wrote the physics today article, <clears throat> So yes, <laughs> highly recommend it. Thank Download you. it and drive up my metrics. <laughs> <laughs> we will, historians in a hundred years will be able to track you through publications, Chris. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. You know, uh, uh, Yerkes has a, a, a profoundly important place in my heart. And so this has just been a, a really wonderful experience for me to take part in. Thank you for that. On behalf of the Space Network and the audience, thank you for that. Um, for the audience members, uh, we've put in the chat ways to sign up for our group and to get our newsletter. And we invite you and welcome you to, uh, to future events. Rich and Chris, thank you both very much again. This has been an awesome presentation and, and just, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye.